What's up, and welcome back to The Greatest Teacher of All Time, where I, Quincy Dawson, interview teachers of color to highlight their philosophies, strategies, and personalities. Make sure you like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and go to greatestteacherofalltime.com to help me support other great teachers like Miss Renee. What's up, Akira? How's it going? Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I met you at this little Black Homeschool Educators Conference, and yes. I really wanted to have you on. So thank you for this. Absolutely. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but let's get into you. So you're super, super interesting because you're actually a music teacher. And I was reading through stuff on your website where you went to the Berkeley College of Music and um, did voice principal over there, right? Yes. So they have at Berkeley, they, you have to choose an instrument and then you choose a major. So my instrument was voice. I've been singing for all of my life. And then my major was music education. I, I um, discovered my passion for education in high school. And so when I went to Berkeley, um, you know, my intention was to, uh, this, the reason I chose Berkeley is because they have a more contemporary music education programming there where oftentimes other schools, it's like, oh, you do classical, mostly the, the education is rooted in classical music. Um, but at Berkeley, the education is rooted in jazz. And so um, to start with jazz and then just get a lot of um, contemporary um, perspective on music education was my purpose of going there. Wow, that's really cool. And I like how you said voice was your instrument. <laughs> or like, you know, like a trumpet or a clarinet, but like you just, you speak it, it's your voice. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Great, great. And so I want to get into like your entrepreneurial life of being an independent teacher and also being in the actual school system too. Okay. But let's start with like the interesting stuff. <laughs> what What is music theory? Because I teach science or I taught science. <laughs> I know that side of the world. So what is music theory? Okay, so music theory, so I'll relate it to science. So music theory is like um, the formulas are to chemistry. So you can put baking powder and what, alcohol, what's the baking powder and water together and it'll fizz up and you can watch it fizz. But to know the formula behind why it fizzes is the music theory. So basically music theory is um, the way that, uh, musicians are able to communicate. It's the language that they communicate with. Uh, if I have an idea for a song, I can't just sing it to you as a piano player and you be able to pick it up. Some piano players can if you play by ear and if you really sit there for a long time and, and do it. Um, but music theory is the language that I'm able, able to write down for you to read it and say, oh, okay, this is what you want. Um, and so as a vocalist, um, is really important because it helps me to communicate with other instrumentalists as well as be able to, if an instrumentalist wants me to sing a certain song, I'm able to, to read that and such and so forth. But also it's um, it's just good for the mind for developing musicians um, because you have to read. It's like, it's multitasking. It really makes your mind like, it, it expands your mind as you're reading and processing and singing and or playing. And um, yeah. Yeah, and that's really cool because um, maybe a little sidebar, but for like the movie industry, right? Movies like the Marvel movies or like Interstellar and stuff like that with like the science-based backgrounds, Ooh. they hire like physicists or chemists to like verify the script. They're like, okay, will this science actually happen? Is this possible? Yes. Talking about you in movies, the only music college experience I think I have is watching Drumline, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> So, so Nick Cannon didn't have the music. Right. Theory. I was just about to say, did you remember that he couldn't read? He couldn't read music. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's the music theory that lets you be able to pick up like a sheet of notes, I guess, and be able right. to. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So where you're able to, to pick up the sheet music and, and read along. And in an ensemble setting, that's really important because as a director, I can't sit down with you and, and give you one-on-one -on -one what your part that you're supposed to play it's just easier for me to hand you the music and you can keep up and something that is really important also just on the education side for students to learn the music theory like I said it it really develops the mind in a way because you have to multitask you have to be able to keep up with the steady beat in your mind you have to be able to listen to what's going on around you you have to keep up with the music you have to play the instrument or sing all at the same time and so what it does is prepares um 
you know, students mind for other things where if I can read music and, and participate in this musical ensemble, then I'm, I'm also able to, to, um, to, um, participate at a high level in something like chemistry or in something like poetry or you know it just helps to develop the mind in a lot of different ways wow that's really cool and I guess it's the same way how they say like math and science is for everyone because it shows you how to think yes would you say say the same way with music theory where it should be absolutely yes absolutely and so with so music theory is not well some people and I teach a music theory class on its own, but it's really, it's, you know, just sitting down and learning music theory, it, it doesn't really make sense if you're not performing. So it goes along with, you know, the study of an instrument, the study of um, some type of performance that you're working towards. And, you know, if I'm interested in piano, if I like to touch the piano keys, then I need to learn just like, you know, with chemistry, you would need to learn formulas. You need to learn music theory to be able to really um, perform at a, at a higher level. Yeah, and that and that makes and that makes sense back to like the physics classes I taught, right? So it's like it's important to know the formula, to know how it's used and stuff, but it's even more valuable to actually do that lab. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I like how we're getting a little connection. <laughs> okay. So I think I want to get back to that, but maybe just breaking um your parts down. On your website, you talk about meal praise. What is meal praise? Um, and I need to update my bio, but the <laughs> neo praise is basically, it's like a little genre I created back when I was exploring the idea of being a musical artist. Um, when I graduated from college, I gave my life to Christ and that really opened up um, a new way to explore music for me, um, where I wasn't just singing to perform, but I was singing to worship. And so as I explored the, that that worship avenue, Um, you know, growing up, my favorite genres was was jazz or neo soul, neo soul like Eric Badu or Jill Scott, um, you know, those types of artists. Um, And so I'm like, okay, like gospel, cool. You know, I enjoy the gospel. It definitely gets the spirit moving. But if I was, you know, riding around every day, I'm not listening to gospel a million, you know, 24 hours a day. Sometimes I just want to have something to lay back and listen to. And so the, and the music that I started writing reflected that because, um, you know, I was, I was into jazz. I was into neo neo soul. Uh, the music that I started writing reflected that style, and so I call it neo praise, where um, you know literally it would translate to new praise, um, but also it's supposed to be kind of like a wink to neo soul, where it's like it's it's praise. We're talking about God, but it's in the soul and the jazz um, style that I enjoy. Wow, that's great, and I think that just shows like your level of expertise in the subject, <laughs> right? Because you hear about science teachers like, yeah, I create this new lab-based science curriculum. Or like a history teacher I was talking to said they create their own Black history curriculum for yeah. social studies, right? Mm-hmm. But you create your own genre of music. <laughs> Do you teach that also? So that genre, no, not specifically. The What I teach in my private studio is more directed um, towards what the students desire. So my students come in and they say, okay, I want to get better at um, vocal control. I want to get better at being comfortable in front of an audience. I want to get better at hearing my part. Then I work specifically with that, not specific, not necessarily a genre. So the students bring in their own music and and usually it's a variety of genres, whatever they're interested in. And that's what I work towards um, their their music goals, um, their technique goals. I work toward their technique goals through the genres and the music that they're interested in. Okay. And so maybe with that, you teaching that specifically, right? There's a quote on your website and it says you learn the science of singing and develop sound through technical technique. If you can speak, then you can sing. Can you tell me about that? Is that true? If I could just speak (laughs) in my regular voice, can I really sing well? Come on. So yes, the science behind it is if you can speak, you can sing. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, man. I've heard myself in the shower. I don't I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I'm <laughs> a good singing, Quincy. <laughs> How does that work, though? Like, what? So, 
<laughs> so literally and basically I like that quote because it helps to kind of loosen people up to to say okay I am interested in singing I don't think I'm that good but I want to go for it and she says if I can speak I can sing so let me try it and basically so the science behind um voice and I'm discovering it more and more the more I do um private private teaching um but the science behind the voice is the air travels up the trachea and it passes um a collection of, of mus muscle and connective tissue that they call your vocal folds and it's right here kind of right where the adam's apple is and when the air passes the vocal folds it causes it to vibrate or buzz and that's what creates the sound waves the literal sound waves and so with singing basically all you're doing is adding more air in order to um, project the voice and so if you can speak you have a voice you're able to sing but it will take work to make it sound good <laughs> Um, but the actual science of it, and it's actually a phenomenon, the research that I've done, scientists still don't really, like they understand the process, but they don't understand how they can't replicate it. And so the voice is, is still really a phenomenon um, as far as creating that sound. And so a lot of people think, um, well, I'm kind of going into another thing, but a lot of people think that, oh, if um, when I sing, it's all like, oh, ah, it's all in here in the throat. That's not it at all. It's really more about the air because the air is what creates the sound. When the air passes the vocal folds, it that's what creates the literal sound waves. And so when I say we learn the science of singing, I'm, I'm more speaking about the technique of it all. So that's my main focus in my vocal studio is teaching vocal technique. And that's pretty much um, learning uh, the properties behind um, singing in a way that that will be healthy. So there are some people who are born and they just have a beautiful voice. You know, it's just like, oh, I, you know, maybe a, their family around them can sing. And so their brain is tuned to be able to sing in tune and they watch their parents sing. So they know how to open up their mouth and and be dynamic. But if you think about artists, like, do you have a favorite artist from like the 90s and now they can't sing the same way they used to? Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, and that's probably because throughout their career, they have not been singing proper vocal technique. They have not been singing with proper vocal technique. And so what happens is it's almost like straining a muscle or tearing your ACL. If you, you know, if you pull strain, have so much throat tension, the vocal folds start to unravel in a way that is unhealthy. The the connective tissue, the muscle, the muscle tissue that's there. And so it's not able to produce sound in the same way. And so learning vocal technique helps to protect your voice. It helps to protect the vocal folds. And it really focuses more on using what they call breath support and breath control to protect your sound and also make the sound a little more dynamic. Yeah. And so I, I guess I'm thinking of two different ways to practice a sport, right? So one way I think of like an NBA player right? They can practice, they can have all their technique, but if they're performing at this super high level their whole lives, of course, they'll be healthier than the average person when they're older, but still like there's definitely some muscle strain where like they're not as good as they were Absolutely. in prime, right? Versus science or math. If you keep practicing these math skills, I think you'll always stay sharp, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think that is with music? Do you think it like deteriorates over time or if you keep at it, it stays strong? So I think the body, so singing is a physical activity yeah. in the same way that, you know, basketball or swimming or something like that is. And that's kind of the example I always give to my, to my beginner students is singing is a physical activity. Number one, you have to learn that technique. You can't just get in the ring with Muhammad Ali and think you're going to punch him out just because you won a couple brawls in the neighborhood. Like you have to learn the technique of it. And so being able to learn that technique and build your endurance up gives you the ability to tour, gives you the ability to sing for an hour and not be tired, you know? Um, and so in that way, the same way, like someone who um, is an athlete, yeah, over time, you when you get older, the body just changes. You're not able to necessarily sing at the same level, but somebody like a Patti LaBelle, somebody like a Shirley Caesar, somebody like a Yolanda Adams, who has been sing, who have been singing, um, you know, properly their entire career, even though it might not be as sharp as when they were young, they're still able to sing in a way that first of all, is entertaining, but also their range, what they call the vocal range, is still pretty much intact. 
Um, and that's because, you know, they've, they've kept their body protected and they, and they've kept their voice protected through vocal technique. However, in the same way, when you're talking about, or in a different way, when you're talking about math or science, and if you learn that technique, the technique is always there. And also if you learn like a mu like music theory, or if you learn, you know, different, how to harmonize, how different core chordal structures and, and things like that, if you keep it up, it stays sharp. Um, and so it's kind of both at the same time. Yeah, man, I love that because these are things like my math science brain does not even think about. We're like, yeah, <laughs> singing is a physical activity. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right on that. And maybe the physical activity aspect, right? So there's a video on your website where you do like a demonstration and you show like a before and after Miss mm -hmm. Renee's uh, singing sessions, right? <laughs> and in the before section, it's this woman and she's just like singing, kind of like moving her head around and stuff. But during the after session, it just looked like she's more controlled with her singing and her breath. Is yeah. that like the type of technique you try to introduce? Absolutely. That is that is my whole point and structure um, and intention behind um, my vocal studio is to bring people in, especially people who have been singing a while and they feel comfortable and it's like, yeah, I can sing. I just something about it. I'm not able to reach that high note when I want to. I'm not able to sing longer than 20 minutes, you know, and it's like, what is it that I'm doing wrong? And usually it's as simple and it's not that simple, but usually it's as, as simple as not enough air or not using the intercostal muscles to support your air and just being able to control and really retrain the mind to take your uh, focus off of this throat area that cannot help you at all and put it more, put all that energy towards the breath support and using the air from your lungs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with that example, that's probably my favorite example. And I'm so glad the cameraman caught it. Um, you know, she has a nice voice. She, she has experience singing, but for some reason, she's just not confident enough to reach that high note. And it's just not coming out. She, she literally says, I can't do it. And um, she chose that song for herself. So I, I think that, you know, maybe she was hoping that I could help her with that high note. And so, um, you know, just giving her a little technique, getting her mind off of, oh, it's a high note and just really giving her the tools to, to send that air through the, through the vocal folds that will help her to reach and execute that high note. Um, and it, and it happened, it, it was just perfect. Like I did not plan that out, but it was perfect. It happened in about 15 minutes. And so I was able to show that before and after. Um, and so, that's really my main that my main focus. And for beginners, I'm so happy that they're coming to me because I'm able to lay that foundation before they get in a cycle that's unhealthy. Okay, I see that. And that video, was that done during one of your independent ventures or was that actually in the schools? Yes. Yeah, so that was that was during where I have a weekly vocal clinic, two weekly vocal clinics, one on Tuesdays and one on Saturdays. Right now, I don't know when this is going to be published, but <laughs> right now I have one on Tuesdays and one on Saturdays. And so that was during one of my weekly vocal clinics where students come in. I show them um, the different I don't want to give away too much, but I show them uh, what I call the four ingredients of vocal technique. We focus in on one where I show them different charts of uh, the muscles in the body, the bone structure and how it, um, you know, it helps the um it helps to know that science side of it in order to support your sound. And then we do different warm-ups that support whatever the lesson was of that day. And then at the end of class, we do what I call field testing. And so that clip was during the field testing part where students can stand up and sing maybe a minute of a song that they're working on. Maybe they have an audition. Maybe they just want to, you know, they've always wanted to sing this song. Maybe, you know, there's something, um, there's a show coming up or something and they're just not as confident. So they can stand up, sing a certain part that they're struggling with. And then I'll give them one-on-one -on -one feedback to help them um, be able to execute. And so that's what was called. Man, that's great. And so, of course, that's talking about you teaching independently. But if I'm thinking about back to when I was like in regular public school, early 2000s, um, music class was just the once a week thing. The music teacher comes in. Um, you learn how to play hot cross buns on the recorder. And if you're interested... <laughs> No, and if you're interested, you pay a bunch of money and join the band, mm -hmm. right? How do you think music classes has changed now since then? And the experience that you're, you said you, that was elementary school, right? Yeah. And so that was early 2000. So already kind of the, the music 
already funding had, had was pretty much dried up by then. Um, and that's why, let me see, where am I going to start? <laughs> so basically, <laughs> basically, um, that's part of why I left the traditional classroom. Uh, because of kind of the experience that you just described now you know in elementary school it is kind of that basic where it's like oh we do high cross buns and and the teacher showed you kind of the little recorder and if it catches you then you join the band um but as far as really what caught me was that you said it was once a week and that's something that um kind of speaks to me that whatever system you were in or your principal um, wasn't really interested in building a music program that they just wanted their students to kind of experience something which the experience is good um, however it really if you only get it once a week it really doesn't lay a, a good foundation for the ways that music can develop the mind and it also is not enough time for you to really get a spark of like oh I do I think I do want to be in band and I think <sighs> there's so many different uh, thoughts in my brain. I think that there are two things that happen. Number one, it can be expensive to have a successful music department. And because of the way the American economy has unfolded, American politics, and, um, you know, specifically within the education system, unfortunately, um, you know, things like music, things like art, things like even, um, Gerald TC has kind of started to, to get, um, a little, a little, um, uh, a little less funding, um, have kind of dried up for some reason. And so I think it's a budget thing, but also I think it's a mentality thing where people really aren't, um, they're ignorant towards the ways that music can develop the mind, number one. And number two, that music and just any kind of extracurricular thing can keep students engaged in school. I know you're a science teacher, but math and science is boring. And so when you, (laughs) <laughs> when you have <laughs> no i'm just this kidding is, i enjoy is, math <laughs> no nah, this is your interview so i'm gonna let you get away with that now <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you have your time I'm gonna let yeah you get... this is your soapbox go crazy <laughs> no i i actually was a math tutor and that's how i discovered i wanted to teach um but the <laughs> the um you know when you after a while it's just kind of like okay math okay but when you get into like a music space even though it still takes discipline if you have the right teacher even though it still takes brain focus if you have the right teacher it's something that you know it's like you you're getting you're uh building up towards a performance or you're learning this new skill that you can show off and that that keeps students students engaged in school I know a lot of of my students particularly and I taught in middle school where they said, I wouldn't even come to class. I wouldn't even come to school if if I didn't have your class today. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is middle school. And so it's, you know, just, it's important, I think, to have those kind of extracurricular um, activities. I lean more towards music, but also, you know, just art and dance even, or um, JRLTC, you have uh, PE and different things like that. Um, That's really important. Um, And so, I'll tell my story basically um like I said in high school so first of all my mother and my grandmother are both teachers <laughs> let me start with that my grandmother they're both 30 had 30 years in the game my mom is still teaching um and, what are they and teaching? so my grandmother was um I want to say elementary school so she taught all the different you know how elementary schools yeah. teach all the different subjects my mother's also elementary school but she's um with the special ed department and so um she works with, you know, students with learning disabilities also at the elementary level. And so for me, in so first of all, I, I grew up singing. My father's a musician. My mother was in the band. She plays the flute. We just music everywhere um, in my life. And so um, I love to sing. We weren't so much in like the traditional church where I was just singing in the choir all day. Like it wasn't that story. Um, it was more just being able to explore different genres like jazz. Jazz was probably my first love. And it, um, in, you know, I was in chorus in elementary school in the, in the, um, in the honor chorus and in the middle school, we had a great chorus teacher, but when the band, the band teacher decided to start a jazz ensemble, they were looking for a jazz vocalist. And one of my friends recommended me. And that's when it was like, oh my gosh, I love jazz. I love this. And so I got to, in middle school, I got to perform at the, the Atlanta jazz festival in Piedmont park and different things like that. And so that's when I was like, okay, music. Yes. I, I, I can't get away from it. 
but in high school it was like I went to a performing arts school um, here in Atlanta and it was just like, okay, like I'm doing it because I love it, not necessarily thinking about career path. But of course, once you get to like 10th grade, everybody's like, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? And so I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life because I didn't want to be a vocalist. I didn't want to be an artist. It it really didn't, um, you know, like I said, my father's a musician. So I grew up seeing him gigging and, and watching the vocalists in the clubs and different things like that. And it's just kind of like, yeah, okay. And then even at the highest level, like a Beyonce, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. It's kind of <laughs> why, you know, just, it didn't appeal to me. And, um, you know, I enjoy singing and, and I still do, but it was just kind of like for what, like the little trophy that they give you if you get a number one album, yeah. So I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then my math teacher um, recommended me to be a math tutor, an after-school math tutor. And when, like, I still remember it just so clearly. The first time somebody who walked in struggling, they were trying to figure out um, variables, like just the simple variable, how to get x equals at the end of like just a, I don't even remember the terms of it or whatever but just the basic like 3x plus 7 equals 27 like what what does x mean they could not get it and when they walked in they couldn't get it and when they walked out they could because of my help I was just so just like ah, so I, you know just like okay I want to be a teacher but what what am I going to teach do I really want to teach math and then maybe the next week, two weeks later, my course teacher asked me to teach one of the freshmen a vocal technique where it's like, OK, she has a good voice, but she please show her how to how to breathe properly. And while I was standing there teaching her how to breathe properly, it just clicked. It's like, duh, a music teacher like you sing, you're a singer. And so from there, it was just music, music teacher all day. Just like, I want to teach. I'm going to teach. I'm going to be a music teacher. And then, you know, doing my own research, talking to my all my music teachers about how much music um, is it um, is a good, it, it, blah, blah, there's, I'm so excited. There, <laughs> how much music um, is advantageous for education and, and the development of the, of the mind. And that just really got me excited about being a music teacher and then to see um how because at that I graduated high school in 20 um in 2009 in 2009 and so that was kind of the beginning of the decline for a lot of um extracurricular uh things and definitely the budget of extracurricular kind of it was kind of the peak of the decline anyways and so to see how um arts programming was kind of drying up in all my life all my life I always had, there was always a music, a band and an art teacher, elementary, middle and high school. And so to see that start to kind of unravel in a lot of spaces where to now in elementary schools, they don't even have a music. They might have a teacher that travels around and comes in, like you said, for once a week, or they don't have an art teacher. And it's kind of, it's up to the, to the homeroom teacher to teach, you so, know, oh, a little extracurricular break. Go ahead. Cause I told so, you. I was <laughs> so, so, so that's what I was going to ask, right? Where. I told you it was hot cross buns once a week. If you had a lot of money, join the band, right? In your 10 years of teaching, has there been any change? Has more budgets increased? Have no. they increased since then? Not at all. Really? And so when I graduated from college, I came back to Atlanta and I was lucky enough, my first um, experience in the traditional classroom was at a, a public charter school that was an art school and so I was because I knew basically the way that people feel about music and arts in, in school I was intentionally looking for an art school because I wanted to be able to have the control and the support to build a, a good program and so at that school I was the only music teacher I taught band as well as chorus um, as well as what they call general music or music appreciation for students who are who are at the beginning. And so because I had the support, you know, they they gave me the students. They, um, you know, I had, it was a new charter, like I was there for its first year. So it was a new charter school. So it wasn't a lot of, of money, but they had, you know, they were intentional about supporting me. It wasn't just, oh, we want to make sure the kids pass the test. It was, no, we want to have a program. I left because they brought in so our first principal he was really about that he was about building the arts program by the time 
it was um, by the time I decided to step away, um, they had brought in a principal who was more about academics. They didn't have a background in arts and basically the scheduling became um, an issue. And so as a music teacher, you know, people look at me like, girl, music is not that important. Like I got to get these kids in the classes they need to be in, um, which is so, understandable. So yeah. is that something that should change? Because I think like as a society, or at least in America, we decided math, science, history, English are important. You do those every day, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think music should be one of those core classes taught every day? I think <clears throat> some type every, of arts class. And also, and also every day for everyone. Mm, right? Yes. I think some type of arts class, if not music, then, and that's kind of where the budget comes in because you have to have a lot of different options for students. If not music, then visual arts. If not visual arts, then dance. If not dance, then, you know, something, something uh, maybe even like computer science or something like that, um, which is kind of becoming more of a, of a um, arts class. Um, something where students are able to create, students are able to have control over um, the way their mind is developing. It's like, yes, I choose to be in band. I choose to be in chorus because it interests me. And um, yes, I think every single day, um, number one, as a music teacher, because it helps you to build a program. But number two, for the students, because your brain is tickled every time. If you only do it once a week and this is what happened um is basically you 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 come in and you're not paying attention you come in and it's just kind of like what is the point of this you yeah know? And, and, and maybe and, on that too it's like you have the music background with like your parents did it so like you grew up doing it I guess I'm asking should every student need that music class though I got you on that one huh <laughs> no you didn't I know my answer I'm just trying to decide the explanation yeah okay, so, okay. <laughs> so my answer would be yes every student I believe should experience what they call general music general music or music appreciation um that's is the hot cross buns yes that's okay. the hot cross bun space <laughs> where students come in and um so right now I'm teaching so not only oh, I like to jump around okay wait let me get my brain together let me answer your question first so yes every student I believe should should experience what they call general music or music appreciation where they come in and they sing they play an instrument they learn basic music theory they learn music history and they also learn about different genres and different careers in the music industry that's how I teach my music appreciation class and so um, what that does is it give it broadens their mind to first of all have a respect for the arts but also <clears throat> to experience culture the way I teach my music appreciation class it's about culture it's about the American history it's about um, how genres and, and creation connect with what we're going through in in the present time or back then the music that was created and how it related to you know whatever was going on in history at that time and so um, I think that's really important because it gives context to creation and so when you don't have that when you don't have that for students then okay they graduate and no they're not a musician but they also don't support the arts they don't um they don't um you know they don't uh know how to choose quality quality um creation and so things like museums start to lose funding because their congress because the congressman didn't experience music or art when he was in high school or um things like um, you know, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra doesn't have enough money to hire enough mu the musicians that they need to put on a proper concert. Not only do they not have enough money because the funding is drying up because nobody is res respects music, but they also have to really scavenge or scour whatever. I don't know what word I'm trying to say to find the musicians because nobody's teaching orchestra anymore. And so, you know, these types of things. And <clears throat> as someone who had contemporary uh, music education training, I understand that definitely we need to move forward. Technology and the use of um, electronic uh, music and just the way that you can create your own songs kind of sitting at a computer, it's important to support, but also having that foundation of playing an instrument, um, which is which includes singing, um, is important for 
the um, the integrity of the art. And so, yes, I think every student should have uh, a music class. Yes. Yeah, I like that. And it's just like um, the math and science, right? Man, I'm never going to use this physics. I'm never going to use this equation. But it's also important to know the value that that equation can get you. Absolutely. Same with music, right? Absolutely. And so yeah. what I was about to share was that I have um, the private studio where I teach, you know, my, uh, for, for lack of a better term, private students. But I also travel around to different schools and teach music also. So right now I'm teaching um, at a private school. I go in, it's a small private school for students with autism. And so they only, they don't need me there all day. They only need me there for a couple of hours. I come in for a couple of hours. I teach general music. Um, and it helps the students to kind of get a release from um, all the different, uh, you know, um, like maps and science and, and things of, like that and just be able to create. Um, and then I also teach for two different nonprofits. One, um, both of them are arts nonprofits, but they're kind of in different ways where one I teach um, a music theater class and then the other one I teach um, more music theory as well as vocal production and um, arranging and different things like that. And so being able to step away from the traditional classroom where unfortunately the respect just wasn't there, where it's just the music teacher is the babysitter. When the teacher is on, um, when they're having their uh, lesson, their, um, oh Lord, I've been around away from the classroom for so long. What do they call it when the teachers they're, get a break? They're oh, planning periods. Planning period. <laughs> so yeah, it's like the music teacher is just a babysitter. When the, when the, teachers are able to when the teachers need to plan a period so throw the kids in music and it's just kind of like okay so not only am is it very clear that what I'm doing is not important um, but also they just kind of throw kids in so I'm not able to develop them as far as the technique and the theory goes um, and so I had to step away from that I had to step away from um, the traditional classroom and go to places where I'm wanted and eventually I'm my dream is to, um, you know, have an art center where students are able to come and be able to experience the arts that they're interested in, or parents are able to to um, explore just kind of those outlets for their students, because a lot of people, and that's where we met at a homeschool conference, a lot of people are starting to pull their students away from the traditional spaces and so you know there there are a lot of pro there's a lot of programming out there to teach parents how to teach um you know math or science um but they still their students still need um an enrichment kind of outlet and so things like art centers and and a vocal clinic is important uh for students like that yeah and you're kind of already getting to it but you've been independently teaching for one year now two years yes so about a year and a half about a so, year and a half. Basically, the pandemic encouraged me, like a lot of people, to to um, start, to go for it, to just see what it's like, see if yeah. you could do it. And I have. Which and is so amazing. I want to know, how has this one, one and a half years been so far? It's been so awesome. So a blend of being an entrepreneur, so the business side and just learning, you know, how to keep up with clients, how to keep up with your budget, how to keep up with the money. Um and a schedule, but then also having the freedom to teach what I want. <laughs> it's It's been really good. Uh, and so just also being able to expand my range from not only uh, the, the school age, but also adults. A lot of my clients are adults. Um, and so being able to teach adults who um, are singing at church or or they are touring on on the road and they just have needed somebody to help them with their vocal technique. Um, and so it's been really cool just bringing in people. It's still growing, um, but it's been really cool. Yeah. Wow. Miss Renee, thank you for this, man. You, you've done a lot in education, <laughs> theory, all that, um, meal praise, everything too, and just how you teach. <laughs> These are all some of the reasons why I think you might be one of the greatest teachers of all time. <laughs> thank you Quincy <laughs> yeah really really and thanks to Transcendence Children and Family Services um, we want to present you with this $100 prepaid gift card to use oh wow <laughs> oh wow you, you call me great and give me money I like it <laughs> yeah right I mean you are a great teacher and I think you deserve it thank you
Yeah, yeah. Um, also, with the support of Victorious R.E.D. Restoration, um, we'd like to actually sponsor one of your classes with a class pizza party. Cool, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So once the cameras go off and everything, we'll figure out how to get those pizzas delivered to you and your class. Okay. Thank you, you deserve it. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you to everyone else for watching The Greatest Teacher of All Time. I, Quincy Dawson, interview teachers of color to their personalities, strategies, and philosophies on education. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video. And if you really like it, leave a comment for me and Miss Renee to see. <laughs> um, also, go to greatestteacherofalltime.com if you know the greatest teacher of all time or if you think you might be the greatest teacher of all time and recommend them to me by clicking on Submit a Teacher. Hope to see you soon. Yeah.